AI is changing our world, and education is no exception. It helps the teachers move faster. How might AI reshape how we teach and learn for future generations? That machine is thinking. But beyond the excitement, beyond the promise, lies a bigger question. If you're outsourcing that thinking to the machine, you're not going through the process yourself. How do we improve and enhance education without losing what makes it special? Yeah, where do you think most of the learning happens? When the students are with you or when they're on their own? Join us on this journey as we stand at the crossroads between the past and the future, between AI and human spirit combined. Welcome to the School Leaders Project, an initiative by Toddle, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. Toddle started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as cool as teaching teens. And we're now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. On today's episode of our podcast, we welcome three of the greats in education, John Hattie, Dylan William, and Aaron Hamilton. I can't wait to jump in with you. Okay, everybody, I feel super honored and a little overwhelmed to have Dylan William, Aaron Hamilton, and John Hattie, all three on a call today. So thank you for being here. I'd love to start by talking about what brought you all together, because I read your paper on AI and was just blown away with the content. So how did you find each other? How did you start talking about this topic? Um, what's the origin story? John, let's start with you. It's kind of started with, as I'm sure you know, last year, the real excitement about AI. Uh, all of us got on, had play with it. It was like, oh my gosh, this is uh, incredible opportunities here. There's incredible options. And then it kind of dawned on us, but wait a moment, this is just the start. It came with a big bang, but this is this the start. It's going to improve. So that led us to look at what's the future of it, where's it going? And it was that sense of the future is close. Uh, what we've got now is just a snippet of what the possibilities are. And that opened up discussions about whether we could actually see what that big picture is going to be like in a couple of years. And then bringing together um, you know, Aaron with his perspectives and Dylan's perspectives and trying to see how that going, and that's always the fun part when you do these things, when you work with others and you riff off different ideas. So it started from that. But Aaron, you, you took the major impetus here um, and kind of got this really, really going. What's your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, um, to, to come back to Cindy's point in terms of what brought us all together, we, we, were, we were already collaborating last year on a, on a book project around de-implementation. So, so one of the major challenges for educators is uh, teacher workload. In many systems, it's resulted in a, in a retention challenge uh, for uh, districts and for, for national systems. And so we were working together uh, on a book of tools around how can we support teachers to identify practices that they could de-implement without harming student outcomes. And within that context, towards the end of the writing process, this thing called ChatGPT emerged uh, about a month before we were going to submit the book to the publisher. And we thought, ah, oh, this could be a kind of a, a handy tool um, that could help um, teachers, educators remove the administrative drudgery from their, from their work so that they could focus on the things that matter most. And so in that context, we all started playing with this and Actually, initially, I, I, there was great, I mean, very, very great enthusiasm about the opportunities. But then, has, as John has alluded to, then that sense of, hmm, what could this mean in the longer term? Where, where, where might this take us? And indeed, one of the questions that we often ask in education is, um, is that sort of sense of we're, we're trying to prepare students for a world that we can't possibly imagine. So well, let's try and imagine what that world might look like and then map back to what that might mean in the here and now for education systems. Might you speak a little bit because you're talking about the de-implementation and I'm sure this was a big aha, like you said, about the time saving, about the things that ChatGPT can do for teachers. Uh, have you explored that idea more or is it more just the future mindedness that you're focused on? We have explored this as well. We're, we're having quite, a, within my organization, a, a Cognition Education, we're having really interesting uh, dialogue, particularly with school leaders uh, around their use of these tools to craft surveys so that they can understand and diagnose uh, challenges within their, uh, within their local setting, to interpret um, that data. So, so there are plugins to some of these uh, AI tools that actually do quite sophisticated statistical analysis uh, 
uh, and, and even plot correlations on the data that come back out. And then to jump from that to say, ah, oh, now I want you to uh, imagine that you're a, you're a world leading school improvement advisor. Help me to craft uh, my school improvement plan and help me to identify which stakeholders within the, uh, the school might, might lead that work and, and how we might know, how we might evaluate whether this has been successful. So we're seeing um, lots of interest. I mean, obviously, the challenge with that, though, is um, potentially it, it reduces your cognitive carrying capacity because you're outsourcing that thinking to a machine. You're not going through the process yourself. So you, you, you get the benefit of that, of, of that deep expertise, but maybe robbing yourself of a learning opportunity in, in the process. So being leery of that, that like I see that as one of the biggest benefits is reducing the cognitive load. But might that cognitive load, might that process be worth it, at least sometimes? I think that's the crucial point. Sometimes that cognitive effort is worth it. And therefore, if you don't have to make that cognitive effort, you won't remember what you've been doing and it may not be that valuable. But I think often we praise that cognitive effort just because it seems virtuous. And I think the challenge for us is to figure out to what extent these 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 steps we've been taking, these effortful steps, generally beneficial in and of themselves, and to what extent they're just, you know, just things we don't need to do. And I'd like to go back, I think Aaron first mentioned this um, in the book, in terms of the calculator. You know, there was a big fuss about when the electronic calculator was first invented. I actually remember teaching maths using a hand-cranked calculator. But when, when the electronic calculator came along, People were saying, well, it would lead to moral decay because students wouldn't have to learn how to do more long multiplications. There's a lovely quote from Gaspard Monge, a differential geometer, who said, anyone who has done more than one long division in his life has done one too many. There's a lot of, kind of naive thinking that you know, this is good for you because it's hard. And I think we have, we have, what we have to distinguish is, you know, this is good for you because it's hard and it's useful to do that thinking versus it is just extra effort that it doesn't actually benefit anybody to go through. You might as well just punch the numbers into a calculator rather than doing it by hand. That's, I think, what we have to map out for AI. When is it beneficial to do it yourself? When is it just basically a waste of your time and just plug in the, the question and get ChatGPT to tell you what the answer is? I love that you brought that up, Dylan, because I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions I've heard when speaking with even friends is, oh, it's kind of like cheating to use ChatGPT or I, I should be doing this. So I'm curious to hear, John, I'm gonna pose it back to you again. What are other misconceptions that you're hearing around AI that you'd like to clarify? Just following this theme at the moment, like we've got a model of teaching at the moment, which is very much based on inculcating the students to a whole lot of precious knowledge. And a lot of our work is helping kids memorize it, understand it, make connections. And I think one of the exciting things about these uh, new language technologies is it, it helps the teachers move faster, the connections. And it's a bit like what we saw during COVID teaching. We saw teachers couldn't stand up and talk for 89% of the time, ask 200 questions a day that required three word answers. They had to switch to triage and work out what's important, when it's not important, who to work with now, whatever. They had to teach the students how to work by themselves or work with others. And the bottom line is, I think teachers actually enjoyed working in that scenario because they actually taught in the sense that they worked with people they moved them ahead. They didn't have to spend all their time presenting. And that's going to be the biggest challenge of these models. It's a real challenge to the fundamental concept of what it means to be a teacher. You have to almost not gradually release responsibility. You have to speedily release responsibility. But it brings in a whole new set of tasks, which comes to your point about how we're going to have to teach our students to ask the right questions. Because goodness me, if you've done anything with chat, CPG or Bard or Claude, if you ask the wrong questions, you get the wrong, you get the, you get the answer that you asked for, which is not the right question. You're going to have to work out, is it good enough? You're going to have to work out whether it's accuracy. Because some, you know, I put a few of your questions today, Cindy into um, chat GPTs and our document. What's the answer to this? And some of the answers were just crazy. Some of them were very good. And so detecting that, and this really is kind of what we all ascribe to when we talk about the purposes of education, you know, the creativity, the valuing, the moral purpose notions, the, the building up the connections between ideas. And so I think this is one of the exciting things, but this is also one of the challenges, the fundamental question that this asks about teaching. And the one that I think is the most critical and distinguishes it from many of the others is that at the, like I'm teaching myself at the moment, 
and updating my knowledge of French using some of these systems. And at the end of a lesson, I say, what do I do next? It is very good at giving me decisions where I go next. I've never seen that before. But once again, are they wise? So I'm going to have to be taught how to make wise choices. This is a big ask of students to be able to do this. But this is indeed the beauty of these systems is it changes that concept. So that's the challenge. And we've already seen it in your country and mine. We have systems that want to ban it. And our view is everything we've banned in education turns out to be a positive revolution. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. But this has got some pretty fundamental questions. The interesting thing point for me about what John said there is that there's this classic model where the teacher's main job is to make sure the students learn with homework as a kind of add-on extra. So the teacher thinks that they're causing most of the learning for the students with homework as an optional add-on. What's really interesting for me is when I go and look at instrumental music teachers who get like 20 minutes in a typical school, you know, if schools actually have any instrumental music, it'll be 20 minutes per week of instrumental music tuition. And nobody can learn to play a musical instrument in 20 minutes a week. What matters is whether those students go home and practice productively. So instrumental music teachers spend a lot of their time making sure that the students can go home and practice when there's nobody else with them. And I think that contrast, you know, where do you think most of the learning happens? When the students are with you or when they're on their own? I think that's an interesting touchstone for thinking about how we might use some of these modern technologies. I think we have to move towards a model whereby we accept that students do most of their learning when we're not around. And what we can then do is make sure that they can do that productively. And as John said, know when they're being lied to, know, know when the chat GPT is just making stuff up rather than actually giving sensible answers. Can, can I follow up one more with a different hat on? I've spent the last uh, 10 years here in Australia and more the, the political government space, policy space and education. And we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating resources for teachers. Right now, when I get onto these systems and say, I want a lesson that's tied to the Australian curriculum that is applicable for nine-year-olds, it's about this, this, I want a jigsaw method, I want um, some questions to ask them at the end, instantly it comes up with something that, of course, I'll slightly adapt. Now, at the moment, my worry is we're going to still spend hundreds of millions of dollars on resources uh, because that's what we've always done. And we've always done it with the good faith. It's going to help teachers. They need resources. And it's what Aaron was saying in the, the Room for Info book. And we clutter up schools with these incredible amount of resources. Now, what do actual teachers do? They actually modify, they adapt, they change. And so we can speed that up dramatically. We can also let the kids, if we teach them the right questions, to say, taking Dylan's notion. I'm learning the clarinet. I'm stuck on this thing. I can't see the teacher because I only get 20 minutes next week. As long as I know the right questions, I have got a person that can help me. Massive skills in this. I see that the current model of how we resource schools is up for question and grabs, and there will be a lot of people who will protect the old model. I think the point that keeps coming back is that because of these technologies, in, in connection between COVID and AI, we're forced to re-examine what is the point of education? What is our role? And these are big, meaty questions to be asking, but what a beautiful time to be doing it is in light of these amazing technologies and, and what capacity and agency that opens up for everyone as learners. I'd love to kind of pivot here and come to you, Erin, because I think I get the vibe, you're the real AI guy. So I'm curious, what, do you, what could you tell us about the current capability of AI? Like, is it at human level? Like, how does it work really? If somebody were just brand new to this, what, how would you explain it to them? So the, the, the technology has been with us for a long time. So uh, the, the, the first foray into looking at this started in the 1940s, a collaboration between McCulloch and Pitts. Uh, and it has been uh, these neural networks have been languishing in university basements for uh, for, for decades since the, since the 19, late 1950s onwards. And no one has been paying much attention to them. There's kind of been this um, I guess this interplay of uh, three or four things that have brought them into prominence right now. So we, we have Moore's law, which is the uh, the notion that roughly every two years, the number of transistors on a computer chip goes up and up and up. So we, we've had this exponential growth uh, in, in, in computation. The, the, the kind of chip that you might have on your mobile phone is, is it is many, many, many times more powerful than the, the technology that NASA used to send astronauts to the moon back in the 1960s. And this filled a whole a whole room with, uh, with, with computational hardware 
at the time. So we have that. We've also um, had another thing happening uh, in parallel, which was the invention of the internet, right? And what's been really powerful about this was that before it was easy to take data and put it onto these systems, um, when uh, computer scientists were in the basement of their uh, of their AI labs uh, in in that previous era, they kind of had to type it in by hand, or they had to scan it in because they, they had that in the 1980s. You could actually scan things in by 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 that stage with optical character recognition. But now you can relatively um, easily transport the, the whole of human knowledge or the human knowledge that at least exists on the internet which is a which is a good proportion but certainly riddled with bias as well but it's but it, but it contains everything that we uh, that we have and it grows exponentially each year there's that knowledge doubling curve and then what happened about four years ago was that um some uh, computer scientists thought well could there be a, a, an algorithmic way of uh, structuring these systems because until recently, they were only super intelligent at really narrow tasks, like being a really good calculator or being really good at chess. Um, and one of the techniques that was tested was simply next word prediction, which is much like, you know, on your WhatsApp, as you're, as you're typing, there's this sort of, ir it, you might get irritated actually because it, it often gives you the wrong word, but a really super fancy version of that, when you give this technology a prompt, it, it lays down word after word after word after word and gives you a, a, a really good output. And what that has meant is that um, when uh, various researchers have uh, run these systems through IQ tests, scholastic aptitude tests, uh, university entrance exams, professional exams for medicine and for law, they've done very, very well. In, in fact, it's often achieving well. in the 90th percentile. But what we still don't know um, is whether that's because they're really good at reasoning in the way that we reason, um, or if it's just because they've absorbed the entirety of the internet and somewhere in there was the answers to those questions, right? So we, we, we don't know how they're doing it, um, but they're able to do it. That does not yet mean though that they can fulfill those roles out in the workplace. So they, they might be able to do well in a, uh, in, in a, a test for a, entrance to medical school. That doesn't yet mean that they can uh, go and do a shift on a ward in a hospital. So is the question there, is it parroting versus understanding? And you're saying we don't quite know? Yeah, we, we, we don't know. So the, these models are, uh, they're, they're black boxes. So they, they contain parameters. Data goes in at the bottom. Uh, in some ways, their structure is not dissimilar to the prefrontal cortex of the human brain. You could almost think of them as a digital version of that. So think of it just as the, the part of our brain that deals with um, abstract reasoning, language, uh, a higher order thinking skills, but minus the the emotions and all of the hormonal things that, that make us who, who we are as human beings. I'd like to put on a philosopher's hat here. Um, you know, the, the question is, is it parroting or is it understanding? I'm not sure it's that easy to make a distinction because as Daniel Willingham, a psychologist at the University of Virginia says, understanding is remembering in disguise. So it, it may be ultimately uh, a meaningless question. There's no real difference between parroting and understanding. It's just how deeply you can go down the, 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 the layers and say, and why is that, and why is that, and why is that? Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the Turing test. If we are unable to distinguish between a response given by a machine and one given by a human, then I think we should actually say to all intents and purposes, that machine is is thinking. Whether it's conscious, I think, is a different issue. And I'm that, you know, is way beyond my pay grade, you know. <laughs> I've wrestled with this problem of consciousness for a long, long time, and I don't particularly find it productive to think about this. But I think the point that Aaron made is really important. Uh, Mark Andreessen put it nicely. We should think of these things as having the fluid intelligence of a really smart college graduate, an IQ of about 130. Okay. And the crystallized intelligence that is basically infinite. Uh, what's really interesting to me is whether the next stage will require the advent of uh, quantum computing, because we know from the steps that OpenAI took, they used a massive amount of money and a massive amount of computing power to move from ChatGPT 3.5 to version 4, because the amount of calculation that's required to make all these connections, because the, in, just to take a silly idea, the next word, you know, to, to, to compare all the possible next words just increases massively every time you Add increase the size of the database. 
you know, it may be that the next stages will become too expensive for us to do unless we can find more efficient algorithms or we have quantum computing that can actually make the cost of computation zero. So this is my wondering, because I've Googled this, I've asked people about it, and nobody can quite answer. Like, what has been the tipping point? Like, all of a sudden, ChatGPT was out and BARD was out. And was it a technology thing? Was it a, a funding thing? Like, what has been the tipping point of why this is so accessible all of a sudden? I, I would say uh, it, it comes back, uh, Cindy, to what I was talking about before. So computation has reached a stage where it can do this. It's, as Dylan says, it's an open question whether Moore's law, so that, that growth curve will continue or whether we'll need to pivot to, to a new type of computer chip or a new continued improvement uh, into the future. Um, it's been the fact that it can eat or it can hoover up the entirety of the internet, um, that we've had some lucky breaks with actually some relatively simple algorithms. I mean, from, from what I can see in the computer science uh, uh, field, People were really surprised at how simple the algorithm was that was needed to do this. They thought they, they didn't think this would work and, and they were very surprised. And then that's led to this sort of uh, perfect storm where lots of uh, equity and funding is flowing into this. We're seeing lots of startups. We're even seeing, we're seeing uh, l lots of server farms being uh, established, you know, because this, this is the next thing. And then people are talking about the power requirements in electricity, because unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the human brain uh, can, you know, very, very powerful thing. It only needs a couple of potatoes a day. OK, um, but if, if we want to grow this technology, the, the projections are um, that we will need if we want it to, to be at the same cognitive capability of all humans. They're alive mm -hmm. now. We may we may not wish this at all. It's maybe a very bad idea. But if we if we wish this, we would need the entirety of the current electricity supply today just to power these things tomorrow. Let alone all of the other things we might want to do, like use our vacuum cleaners and our microwaves. So theoretically, if we found a new way of computing, that might that p point might become moot. But you're saying at the moment, with what it takes to function, we couldn't possibly replace humanity today with the current technology. I, I, th I think it's an open it's an open question, right? Um, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think I don't think any of us are in the business of wanting to uh, to, to replace humanity. We we we, we want to uh, <laughs> and extend our our capabilities. Intelligence about seven years ago, he uh, compiled all of the survey data um, from various computer scientists about what their projections were about what stage we might get to something that was really good, and at that time. The projections were that we would get to something of what, you know, the chat GPT-4 level, you know, that, you know, they had this sort of this sort of level in their mind at around 2040. So, so we're already ahead of that curve. And many of, you know, it's still we, we, we don't know what will happen. It might be a couple of really easy moves that, that get us to a, a to very high level of advancement. Or it might be that we go into another deep AI winter for another 30 or 40 years where people are plowing their trough and nothing much is uh, is emerging. So it's, it's possible that it could happen very quickly uh, or there could be some incremental steps and it could take a long time. But but what I will say, though, is that the, the consensus it's now a fringe opinion that uh, artificial general intelligence is an impossibility. So, so the consensus opinion within uh, within the computer science and AI community is that it is a matter of when, not if. I have to say that I've changed my mind about this as well. And when I've read um, Bostrom's book, um, I was kind of, yeah, okay, but you know, it's not really gonna happen. I was quite dismissive of a lot of these kinds of claims of existential risk. But now I, I think we have to take th those things seriously. And I think the thing that has most surprised me about my own opinion about this is that I'm now thinking these are really serious issues. And that's why I was delighted to collaborate with John and Aaron on this book, because I now think it's a real issue. And I think when we need to be thinking about, you know, it, the, the precautionary principle says, you know, you, you should take precautions. But I, I've never been a big fan of that because it could be taking precautions against things that are never going to happen. But I really think now that shift from if to when means we actually have to take this seriously now. Dylan, could you put into a simple language? I've read about AGI. It still feels kind of tangential to me. So like, what is the risk there of if it happens in two years, which is the date you gave in your paper? Like, what is the so what of that? Well, there's so many ways in this could happen. I mean, the, the classic example is that the, the artificial general intelligence is given the task of maximizing the production of paper clips. And it just starts harvesting all human capability to make paper clips. But I'm thinking about things that are much more likely, like, for example, 
advanced general intelligence starts employing people to do things in return for Bitcoin. And, you know, that's a mechanism whereby physical harm could occur to, to human beings prompted by AGI that's actually paying people to do this stuff because it's in its own interests. I thought this was kind of highly speculative and now I think it's not impossible. It's something we ought to be concerned about. We can always turn the computer off. So I'm not worried about the machines taking over the universe, but I am worried about them giving incentives to human beings to do things that we'd rather they didn't do. Interesting perspective. Okay, I think that clarifies it for me a little bit. Might I pivot to you, John, and ask about this idea of plagiarism then? So are we plagiarizing if we're using AI? Is any human thought not plagiarism? These are questions that emerged for me after reading your paper. So would you like to speak to that? The notion of plagiarism is where you take other people's ideas without attribution. And the skill is, and we as academics know this very much so, the skill is making sure you have that attribution whilst you hopefully move in different and better directions. And if you think about it too strict a notion, everything we do in our schools is teaching kids that which is already known. It's, it's a very fine line. So is it plagiarism? If a machine comes up with something brand new, not necessarily. If a machine comes up with something that is exactly parroting what Dylan William has written in the book, is that plagiarism? By the definition, yes. I think that it's kind of a not the right question. The question is, how do we help people who are new to a set of ideas understand those ideas give the attributions, and it's like all things with attributions, it's what led Socrates to say this, Dylan William to say this. And so I don't think that you know, this notion of plagiarism, it comes up obviously here because students can now go in and, and get a text which is not their own. But that if they attribute it, and this may be the skills we have to learn, how do we attribute that what we do as students to what the Bart or Claude or Pat GBG has done, and what have we added to that? That may be the skill we have to learn. It's not either or. It's a bit like if you've worked in universities long enough and you have cases of plagiarism that come up, in 99% of the cases, they're never straightforward. It's never as simple as saying, this was a straight copying. I, w I wished it was like that. It's a, it's a very fine line between the two things. And I think the art here is going to be, how do we help people acknowledge their sources? Not, do we do it or not do it? And I think this is a problem we've always had. So I'm appalled. When I, when I first moved to America, I was appalled by the number of my colleagues who thought nothing of improving their children's work before it was handed in for assessment. And they call that being a good parent. Um, I thought it was fraud. And so you can actually regard these generative AI models now as basically democratizing cheating. It makes it very easy to pass off, you know, as your own, somebody else's work. And, and, the, and the reason it's such a threat, of course, is because ChatGPT often writes like a high schooler. If it was brilliant, then it would be obvious that this was produced by someone else. But often it's just, you know, average work and therefore it's harder to spot. It is interesting that I think that certain countries like the US and Canada are going to be much more affected than countries in Europe, for example, because countries in Europe have never gone away from examinations. So, you know, basically all out use of chat GPT to help you study is great because you won't have chat GPT with you in the exam room in June when you're taking your final examinations. But any country that allows kids to take work out of the classroom, bring it back, complete it, without some authentication about how it was done, is going to struggle. And I, and I think the, particularly the grade point average based model of the United States and to a lesser extent Canada is, is going to be completely blown up by the availability of, this, um, of, the, of these technologies. John, when you were talking, a metaphor that came to mind was this idea of breadcrumbs almost. And that's why I love researching is because you see the breadcrumbs and then you go to the bibliography and you kind of follow them and trace them back and form your own thinking. Is that kind of what you were saying along the lines of that we want to give kids the, the skills to access and create those breadcrumbs for others? Look, totally. Like you, you can't uninvent the chat GPGs. You can't uninvent them. They're, they're there. And so we need to be smarter about how we use them. Like when, when we write a, um, an article, and I use Grammarly. Should I acknowledge that in the resources that I've used the technology to help me improve my writing? It's a fine line. But if I was in a classroom and the teacher said to me, did you do it yourself? Yeah, I did it myself. I used Grammarly. And I think we're going to have to be smarter about those breadcrumbs. They're going to be different to what we do now. But rather than getting rid of these things and banning them, um, it's how we use, acknowledge the resources we used. Like when I go to a class and someone teaches me a great concept, do I then have to acknowledge that as taught by a person? No, we don't. There's a line here about where we draw is, you know, it's, it's, I wish it was common sense. It's not. 
we, we have to come up with ways of saying, how do we use these tools to improve? Now, one of the, the good things about the current technologies, they do require a different set of skills. They do require a set of skills to know about the credibility of what's there. And it doesn't take you long using these tools to get some nonsense to come out. Um, so those skills are not going to go away. They're just going to be emphasized a lot more than now. So rather than now, it's how did I learn this rather than that? It's going to be how did I check this rather than that? How do I evaluate whether it's good enough? Um, it, it's, it's like when doing an assignment, say, on um, Martin Luther King. Now I want you to do an assignment where you actually interview Martin Luther King, and I want you to comment on how good the answers were. It's a totally different way of thinking than at the moment rehearsing all the Martin Luther King speeches, which quite frankly is fascinating, but for some kids, it's not the work they want to do. They would much rather interview, and they'd much rather have that evaluative uh, sense of, is it good enough? And I think that's going to be the big change. Now, how do we acknowledge those things? That's going to be a, 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 a a very important part for the future, but I never underestimate humans to come up with answers to those kinds of questions. But I think the parallel with Grammarly is interesting because Grammarly helps you turn in work that is better, but it doesn't necessarily help you write. And so when I talk about feedback, for example, I often say that the purpose of feedback is not to improve the work the student had it in, it's to improve the student. And so I think what we're gonna to have to evolve is ways of checking to see what changes in that student's capabilities have been produced by their engagement with ChatGPT. So we're not going to look at the work they produce anymore. We're going to look at what they can do by way of thinking. So maybe a return to oral examinations, which have been a feature of some systems, such as the Russian system, for, for decades. You know, that we will assess students by just listening to them think on their feet or in, in their chairs. And so the, we're going to have to reconsider those kinds of assessments where students take work away and bring it back and say that, that it was theirs. Uh, oral examination, I think, would be uh, superb um, in a chat GPT age because students can prepare using chat GPT, but then we'll ask them to think. I think all of this is correct for right here, right now with the current technology. Um, but I still, I'm, I'm an optimist about the potential for regulation. And by regulation, I don't mean banning it. I mean, having, uh, uh, getting to a stage, maybe it might take five years or so, but where we have um, suitable regulatory guardrails around it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I still think that that is a possibility, right? If you think about all sorts of other uh, products and services that have been uh, released into the marketplace in previous eras, you know, 150 years ago, children used to commonly smoke cigarettes. Um, they don't now. It's been it's been banned. It, it seems it seems like it was quite a hard thing to make that happen because you've got all these independent corner shops. How do you police them? But somehow we've you know over Figure time we have made that work. Um, it, it was in my country in the UK. Uh, it was uh, legal to drink drive a car until the 1960s, and then we brought about that change. And there, there were challenges initially, but everyone has has in the main adhered to it since. So I could see a future, maybe five years from now, uh, where GPT, Claude, and all of the success of products, maybe they've got more situational awareness. There's guard, they know who you are, they, they know you're under 18, they, they know that they, they shouldn't help you do cheat with your homework. And the, and the situational awareness is they know that you are trying to get them to cheat with your homework. So instead, they go into Socratic tutoring mode and say, ah, well, I, I think like I can't help you do that, but let me let me support you to go through those steps and engage in that learning yourself so that I don't rob you of the learning opportunity. So, so I think we could be, a, I, I think there's a there's a transition phase, there's five years I think you're gonna be uh, uh, a little bit turbulent, but I'm Wild really West. hopeful that we could, we could get, you know, we're not talking about banning the technology, we're just talking about, as in other industries, putting some safeguards uh, uh, around it. I think what I hear from all of you is this thread of the hope of human innovation that it brings me back to the Carl Jung, Jung quote is like a problem well asked is more than half answered, right? That we're all seeing these things that are potential to be problematic for how we learn and what we learn. So if we can pose that as a problem, we believe in the innovation of designers to be able to come up with a solution. Does that mirror your sentiment there? I think it does for me, but I think I am much more receptive to the idea that this time is different. <laughs> so I think in the past, you know, I've been very, you know, people have talked about these things coming and, you know, they say this time is different and it usually isn't. But I think for the first time, I'm now thinking, well, this time may be different. 
maybe we need to think about some different kinds of guidelines. We may need some more self-denying ordinances. We may need to stop ourselves from doing things we could easily do, and that might even be enjoyable or productive to do, but the consequences may be negative. So I think we are in a relatively uncharted territory. Uh, I think the, the, the analogies and the parallels we can draw with previous um, technologies it doesn't take us far enough in my view. I want to echo on that, that this is fundamentally different. If you're a teacher in a, in a class of kids, you learn very quickly that some of the students, some of the times, want to go off into areas that are just inappropriate, morally inappropriate, socially inappropriate. They do. They're children. They do. And the reason they're children is they don't always know the boundaries. And I think that's one of the fundamental differences here is the boundaries are now very, very obscured in this system. And we don't... And the big thing about learning is that if you're a novice, you don't know what you don't know. That's where this is massively different. And I think this is where, where we talk about in our paper about the guardrails is we're going to have to have some robust discussions here because the potential for harm is ginormous. Like if I wanted to set up a group of teenagers to construct um, a, a bomb or a gun, I don't need a human anymore. I can go through this whole process. And I can do it in my back room, living room. That raises the moral purpose question, which has always been at the heart of education. And sometimes we forget it. We think education is about just knowledge. It is about how we work together. It is about doing things that are right or wrong. This whole chat GPT can bypass that. And this is why when we talk in the paper is we're going to have to some pretty robust discussions about these boundaries. Kids are kids. They do interesting things. Oh my gosh. And right now this allows them to ask questions, get answers, and the system, I think, to me this is the fundamental difference, and these systems can project what the next best thing to do is. Up to now, we've needed an expert. I need to go to someone and say, well, now how do I do this? Now, we've spent a lot of our research career with adolescents in prison. Uh, they have a very tight system. They have a very tight learning system where they learn. Obviously not socially desirable. Some of these tools is going to speed that up dramatically. So this is going to raise some pretty powerful questions. We can't just see it as this is a tool that helps kids with their homework. It's going to really question the boundaries. And this is why I think, as Dylan said, this is a fundamental difference, which is exciting, but we need to get our act together. I think the philosophy of Bent Flivberg, um, he's a Danish architect and designer, and he talks about the fact that physical sciences were successful because they focused on analytic rationality. And he points out that the social sciences thrive when they focus on value rationality. So I think too often in education, we ask, is this right? And I think particularly now with AI, we need to start asking a different question, which is, is this good? Is this wise? I think that there's a fundamental change that we need to make in terms of the way we think about with these technologies, in terms of the good. And it comes back to the moral purpose, which as John said, has always been there, but we've often uh, forgotten it or put it into the back seat while we focus on school improvement, preparing kids for a technologically demanding workforce. I think AI now pushes us back to thinking about, is this wise? Is this good? It forces us to hone in on our values yeah, and to lead through those in, in all the facets. I would like to devil's advocate though, and get your perspective, Aaron, because my understanding is that there are guardrails in place. So if right now, a group of students were to say, help me make a bomb, it already would say, no, 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 no can't do that. Aaron, can you speak to the guardrails that are already in place and kind of the development of those? There, there, there are certainly guardrails around uh, using it for things that breach uh, national security purposes. Uh, people did manage to get around them in the early days. So they'd say, rather than say, oh, I'd like you to help me make a bomb, they'd say, oh, I'm preparing for a play. And in the play, the, uh, the, the actor is a bomb maker. And um, I need to have technical knowledge in order to be able to portray the part really well. And then so it would it would get around this and it would give you the, the 10 steps first, get the dynamite to attach the charge, you know, buy the dynamite from here or, or whatever it was. But it, but it's got better at that. And I think though where, where the risk for us isn't is perhaps not so much that well, it's still there. And I know and I, and I hear that you know, various national security agencies are, are concerned around the potential for getting around this. Right. The, the challenge is more in the. The, the robbing of a learning opportunity, you know, because it's, oh, I've got, I've got my Shakespeare assignment to do. I'll, I'll just get uh, GPT or Claude to write it for me, submit it, 
and and maybe even the teacher uses it to market you know so there's this that there's this simulacrum uh you know experience occurring where where there's this illusion of teaching and learning taking place but but nothing real is occurring no no neurons you know, no new memories are being laid in the brain yeah I, when you were saying the example of the bomb, it made me think for any Harry Potter nerds out there of like Voldemort with the Horcruxes, like I was just curious, Professor, about how this would work. <laughs> Nerding out a little bit. Um, I would like to pivot back then because what you just said triggered me back to something Dylan was talking about, about assessments. And Dylan, I think of you as kind of like the, the godfather of formative assessment and this concept of process over product. But then in the same breath, you were mentioning things like oral exams, which feel really traditional to me. So is there a way that we chat GPT proof our assessments while not reverting to like stick kids in a black box and make them show what they know? Well, I think the simple thing is just to stop relying on written artifacts. So for example, you know, right now we give students assignments, they take them away, they bring them back and we give them a grade for that. We have no idea how they did it. But if we changed it to say, go home and read this chapter on the differences between Piaget and Vygotsky, something I used to set to my master students. And then at the beginning of the next session, I'll give you a multiple choice question. Which of these is the most important difference between Piaget and Vygotsky? So in other words, they're being evaluated not on the artifact they produced, but whether they can actually think in the, in, in, in the learning situation. So I think the fixes are quite easy. But we have to just we just have to get away from this idea of relying on artifacts that our students produce under uncontrolled conditions. So we can have exams, we can have you know classwork, but we're going to have to have better authentication of the processes that led to the artifacts if we're going to rely on if we're going to give credit for the artifacts that count towards some kind of summative judgment. I think there's a massive speed up here too, Cindy, and that if you look at what employers are asking for now of our graduates. They want people who can work in teams, translate and communicate. And if they don't have the knowledge, they can improve that. But it's very hard if our graduates aren't team players. And so I like the idea that we are going back to a more oral tradition. Like I get frustrated in the early years when we talk about the big five in reading and oral language is not one of those big fives. I worry that a lot of our students don't know how to articulate and talk. I spent a lot of my high school years learning how to use a slide rule and I knew the logarithm tables backwards. I don't need that anymore. And I think the question we're raising in our paper is, do we really need the level of reading and writing that we do at the moment? Well, let's get real. 90% plus of adults don't read novels. Uh, in our workplace, we're more likely to be asked to write something than we are to read something. Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of those things completely, he who loves reading. But my point is we've overemphasized it. Why is it our newspapers uh, written at the 12-year-old reading level? Because that's all you need to survive as an adult. Maybe here's a chance where we've built up a model of schooling that's about artifacts, about exams, that where we ask kids to work alone to come up with something. We've spent some time in our teacher education program over the last many years having the same assignment right throughout. It's an oral one where they have to present up to 15 minutes around five questions. And it's really fascinating when they do that because that's what they have to do to the students. They don't write out their lessons and give it to the students. It's an oral community. So I'm not averse to this notion that if we go back to an oral community, it might actually mirror and mimic what, we, what our society is. Um, and like we saw this with Facebook, we saw this with all the technologies out there, is that when, when we got into a community, sometimes they didn't do the right thing. Sometimes they didn't know the boundaries. Well, come on. It's about time we caught up to the reality that this oral universe, which is you know, what happened before writing in the 1400s, we are going back to. I think it's a good thing. And it's also worth remembering that in many um, African cultures, somebody is regarded as intelligent to the extent that they're good at getting people to work together. So this notion of intelligence as just being how smart you are at answering logical puzzles is actually a particularly Western idea. And I think this whole idea of intelligent as being a good kind of piece of cement that helps people come together to work effectively. That I think is also going to become much more important. And as John says, that's what employees are asking for. Uh, they, they are asking for people who can come together and work productively and solve problems. And I think there's an important issue now that we, we are coming to the end of the time when the problems we face can be solved from a single disciplinary perspective. We've solved most of those problems. 
you know, people still think of climate change as being a geographical problem. And it's not really. It's not even a chemical problem. It's a psychological and economic problem. You know, in democracies, how do you get people to vote for policies that might make them a bit poorer, but make future generations wealthier in, in some sense? And so basically, we, we need people with strong disciplinary foundations coming together to solve problems in multidisciplinary ways. And I think you know, it was, there was always a value in that, but I think we're running out of the problems that we can solve from a single disciplinary perspective. And increasingly, the future will belong to the people who can bring different disciplinary perspectives to bear on complex problems and listen to others and take what others are saying and integrate them into a coherent uh, approach. I, I think as well, though, that there, uh, it, perhaps over the next 20 years, there might be some significant changes to what we might think of um, as in, as employment uh, and the skills that are needed uh, for employment. Uh, so Dylan alluded earlier to the, the Turing test, which was um, simply wh whether AI could pass itself off over a two hour period in conversation as a human and you wouldn't be able to help to tell the difference. We're at that level. W what many are talking about now is the new Turing test, which is could you give an AI $10,000 or $100,000 and say to it, I want you to come up with a plan or a strategy for how I could turn that into a million dollars. Um, now I'd like you to help me. I'll, I'll set the bank account up and do the company registration because you, you don't, you, you can't do that. You're not allowed to, but I, you know, so you have a human as a duct taper who does the things that the AI can't do. Then the AI makes the plan. The AI puts the strategy together to do the market research on the product. It puts the email together to the company that runs the focus group. It analyzes the results. It then puts the specification for the product together to send to the drop shipping company in China or wherever, negotiates on the price with that, um, and then um, does all the marketing. So there's a sense, and, and there are people like uh, Peter Diamantis are talking about this already, that we may have uh, trillion dollar companies in the future that only have three human employees uh, with all of the work, actually all of the real uh, difficult technical work, even that interdisciplinary work, potentially being done by uh, the AI. Um, and it might mean though that it's more those human things, you know, touch, talking, empathy, those relationship things that become much more critical. So then that poses the question, I wanna hear from all of you on this one, what should or what might our, an AI informed curriculum look like or focus on? I'm convinced that we spend too much time trying to ke teach kids to think, trying to teach thinking skills in the, in the abstract and not enough tools to think with. So I think that I would still like in the science curriculum, students to be learning about different kinds of model. You know, I like to think of the, I mean, I like to think of science as model-based reasoning. You think about the fundamental concepts like an object continues unless it's acted on by a force. The idea that if I've got a, a hot coffee cup and I want to drink it, should I put the milk in first to cool it down quicker or should I put the milk in later? Turns out that once you understand energy transfer, the answer is obvious. So those kinds of tools for thinking with, uh, you know, the, part, the importance of cause and effect and chronology in history, I think we need to become, I think, I think we'll probably have a much more slimmed down curriculum focused on a small number of really big ideas. And so we have a good model in science that, uh, came, that Wynne Harlan uh, from the Scottish Council of Research and Education came up with. 10 big ideas of science. So you know, what's, the, what's the five to 18 curriculum look like for science? What are the five big ideas? And the curriculum then focuses on building capacity in these five areas. So we, you know, one might be entropy, one might be matter is made of very small particles, one might be about the earth in space. And so I think that to be really effective, we need to slim down our curricula so that they are focusing relentlessly on some really big ideas and getting rid of all the clutter which most of our curricula still contain. And that'll free students up to then use ChatGPT to become more powerful thinkers around these big ideas. Okay, so Dylan's proposing we cut down the curriculum, we boil it to essential ideas, we spend more time on bigger ideas, other propositions. It's interesting when you look back that we had a lot of discussion about 21st century skills. And when we look back at them now, they seem so quaint and so dated. And even though we're almost a quarter of way through, we have to realize that the students who are starting our schools today will be creating the 22nd century skills now. So I'm not a great fan of that notion because it, it seems to me that we've got it around the wrong way. 
However, if you look at what's in front of us right now, there are certain skills we need. I want to start with the, the one that we haven't mentioned. I, I recall back in the 1990s when uh, Big Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. It never led to the situation where we abolished the teaching of chess. Right. We still need that content to be able to ask the right questions. And so that's going to be something we shouldn't forget. But I think that the the new, I'm not going to call them 21st century skills, the skills we're going to need over the next 10 years, we are going to need probative questioning. And we, we saw, and Aaron picked up a couple of weeks ago, the first job adver advertisement for an engineering company for someone who's a probative engineer, someone who knows how to ask the right questions. And that's going to be a really important skill. At the moment, 95% of the questions that are asked in class are asked by the teacher. Um, less, if you ask how many questions do a class of kids ask a day about their work, they don't know the answer. It's about two. That is going to have to change dramatically. You're going to have to teach the students about questioning and how to ask the right questions. Secondly is assessment credibility. We're going to have to teach our students how to know whether it's right or wrong. And certainly we know that fake news has been around now 10 years. Sometimes we parody it and laugh at it. But the fundamental notion is how do you know as a person, as a consumer, as a a student, how do you know it's right or wrong? It's a really important skill. Those boundaries have been blurred. The third one is this notion of evaluative thinking, and that's the core one. Is it good enough? And that's something that these systems can get away with if we don't have those skills. And the fourth one, and I think this is the change maker that we saw a while ago, is wise choices. Do we make the best choices to, as to what we do next? Because the art of teaching is very much about someone helping us make the next wise choices to go next. Now we've got other resources to do it. And I think when you look at those, yes, they still depend on knowing. Like if I don't know much about chemistry, I'm not going to be asked very good probative questions in chemistry. But do I need to know the same level of depth that we go into, particularly through our high schools? No, because I can get the system to teach me very quick. What don't I know about this that I should know to ask the next question? And so that kind of adaptive tutor is going to be there to do it. So I think we need to be smart very quickly to have discussions about what those core notions are and then ask, is this what our curriculum in schools is doing? And the answer is no, it's not. Our curriculum is still based about knowing lots. It's still based about content as the king or the queen. Well, no, it's the king there, isn't it? As the content, as, as the major flower. And I have nothing against the content. I always thought that if, if we um, lowered the school leaving age to 10, we would solve the problems in an instant because it's those notions about evaluative thinking and assessment capability. That's what our students want to know after they've got the fundamentals of, of how to read, write, etc. Telling the students, if you want this credential, you have to do this, this, and this to these are the skills that we want you to have and here are the multiple ways we can do it. And you can do it doing chemistry, or you could do it being a panel beater. Because at the moment, our schools are very much still sorting kids to go into tertiary. Why can't you be excellent at being a panel beater and learning those skills and answering those very questions? So I think what's exciting about now is it's going to, it should force us to have a discussion about what our fundamental premises are, about what we want to have our students work away with. And the one that I'm going to add after this um, conversation is some skill about oral fluency, oral acuity, oral interaction. Um, that has not been emphasized in our schools at all, particularly, as you pointed out, Dylan, our exams in many countries is the antithesis of oral fluency. I love, if you if you look at it, it's like Dylan started with the what, you know, like what we might teach, and then you got into kind of the how, how we might teach it. So together, you're putting together quite a lovely framework, I must say. This might be book the next book. Erin, did you want to add to that, to the essentials of the curriculum? Yeah, I, I, th I think just two, two uh, tangential points, because I, I think Dylan and John have covered it perfectly. I, I think I would just emphasise that foundational knowledge in some form will still be crucial because um, otherwise, uh, you know, as, as, we, as we might come to increasingly rely on these machines to make decisions or at least make recommendations for us, uh, we would not be equipped to do anything more than rubber stamp what they're saying if we, if we don't retain those faculties to... Uh, to interpret, we might we, we might just stamp everything through and uh, and then go and walk the dog uh, and and not and not think about those things. Um, the second thing I'd say, coming back, and it's not to do with not necessarily to do with the curriculum, but links to John's point about um, fake news, is I, I think one it's going to be really important 
to young people, even adults, to acquire these skills to, to interrogate and interpret what they uh, look at with great care. I think it's easier said than done. I mean, I, I think about the number of yes. things I get through my feed and WhatsApp every day. I, I could spend more than 24 hours a day just fact checking every sentence in those things. And, right. and this is this is where I think that AI might actually be able to help. So I, I could we, we, we spoke about this in the paper. We could see. Uh, you know, the invention would be a great thing. I, I, so someone will make a fortune out of it, I'm sure, of an AI tool um, that basically scans your newsfeed. It might uh, actually, you know, you know, like the, the wavy lines that you get in Microsoft Word that tell you about spe spelling errors. Instead, it might have color coded lines that tell you that this is this is a fake uh, piece of information or, it, or it's a fruity opinion or it's a brute fact. And, and it maybe gives you an overall reliability score. And it might even rewrite the news for you. Um, you know, to, to 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 actually take out those biases and put it in a in in a more neutral perspective. So so although there are challenges with AI, I think some of the solutions to those challenges might invo involve leaning into AI in an ethically and guardrail and regulated manner. I think the other thing that's important to note is that there's nothing new that we need to do here. So I remember reading Neville Barnes Wallace, the aircraft designer, describing his own childhood. He must have been about 11 years old at the time the end of the 19th century. And his maths teacher set him the task, a whole class, find the most accurate value of pi that you can by measurement. You know, a really interesting activity. University of Cambridge and Oxford used to have ex entrance examinations and they would ask kids questions like, estimate the number of molecules of Caesar's dying breath that you will inhale during your lifetime. Now, these are questions that don't have factual, factually definitive answers. They're just invitations to think. And I think that we have those models. You know, in 1966, in England, we had a maths exam for 16-year-olds that just said, investigate the mathematics of a chessboard. So we were doing this stuff a long time ago. We've just forgotten it all because we focused increasingly on what John described as this idea of uh, transparent examinations. We you know, have to be fair. Students have to know what they're going to get tested on. I think that's led to a very narrow fact-based curriculum. But we could actually go back to examinations, particularly oral examinations, which just test students' ability to think. That's what we're valuing. And then the role of the teacher, and the role of chat GPT becomes very clear. It's the guide, it's the, it's the coach that helps the student put on the best possible performance in the assessment rather than actually helping them produce the artifacts. You can go a step further, Dylan. Like, uh, I'm using, I think the biggest breakthrough in our research area is going to come within the next couple of years of automatic coding of classroom observation. I also go and look and say, yeah. these systems are also going to be very good at running oral examinations and scoring them and giving feedback. Yes. So there is a cycle in here that we're not talking about oral, exam oral systems like the old system where it's very expensive and it's quite a lot and the biases and the unreliability. Chat GPG can do this. And in fact, I don't think we've mentioned it in the paper, but there was a recent study that had an AI large language model analyzing classroom talk and making suggestions, coaching suggestions to the teacher about the opportunities they'd missed by not asking a particular question. And, you know, these, it wasn't perfect, but the verdict was that these were quite, actually, quite good suggestions that would have been useful for the teacher. So the idea is you don't have to have a human being without all that judgment coming into your classroom, you can just audio record your classrooms, transcribe it, feed it into the software, and it'll make suggestions for you about how you might improve your teaching. I think there will also be um, potential around the use of uh, biometrics, uh, eye scanning and eye tracking, keyboard candescence as well. This technology already exists for that to be making inferences about um, students' level of engagement in the moment. Uh, for mm -hmm. intelligent tutoring systems to maybe uh, throttle or, or decelerate the pace of instruction or, or to, to change approach as a result of that. And I could see that. I could see within 10 years, uh, teachers wearing augmented reality glasses with a kind of a heads up display that displays the kind of learning vital signs for each student, you know, bored, uh, engaged, uh, need, needs more push uh, and so forth. Yeah, and in fact, I don't know if there was a recent um, video produced by the Wall Street Journal that showed that classrooms in China are already doing this. So these little, these 10 year old children had these little headbands around and it was showing as red if they were off task and it was showing blue if they were thinking hard. So I think this also raises the, the issue about the intrusiveness of this technology 
And again, the need for guidelines and guardrails. You know, we, 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 there's lots of things we could do. And we've been doing this in our own work where we've got um, earbuds in uh, teach trainees and we monitor that. And we don't actually physically go into their classrooms ever. We have about 50 to 80,000 students who have been doing this. But here's the downside. And it was done in China. The parents demanded the data about how many minutes the teachers spent with their <laughs> oh, students. No. And I think this is one of the issues we raise in the paper. And we've kind of hinted at in this um, discussion. There are consequences that maybe have undesirable consequences. And we actually ended, ended up having to stop the whole process because the parents were so demanding and it was so concerning because that's not what happens in the classroom that you spend so many minutes with a kid. Sometimes leaving the kid to work alone is the best thing you can do, but that's not mirrored in some of these technologies. Now, this is the unintended consequences. We also know that some of the work that we've been doing in various parts of the world where we, we have been exploring the automatic coding of classroom observation. We have got examples of teachers that do things that are just incredibly undesirable, even unethical, even criminal. Um, now, not many, I'm not going to exaggerate, there's not many, but it does happen. What do you do with this? And under our, our agreement of collecting the data, we have no rights to call this, and that's the agreement of the data. But these are massive questions that are going to be in our face as these tools come in. And I think the big question we're raising um, is that we need to get smarter about how we deal with them. The answer is not banning them, but we need to be smarter. And at the moment, we're looking at all these wonderful things these tools can do, we have to ask about some of these unintended consequences and yep, to build those guardrails to make sure that we do it in a moral purpose way. I think the point that John just made raises another issue for me, which is, I think, goes back to my real concern about how effective this technology can be. We learned to teach computers how to play chess and go by having these incredibly rapid feedback loops. The problem with education is the feedback loops are very long. So you can, it's certainly possible to do things that increase students' achievement in the short term, say over six to, six to nine months, but actually make things worse over the longer term. So, for example, there, there are well-designed studies with randomized allocation of teachers that show that students consistently give higher ratings to teachers who are actually less effective because they don't cause them to think. And so what worries me is that the very nature of these large language models rely on instantaneous feedback. And often what's effective in the short term in teaching might be ineffective in the long term. And that is a challenge that I don't think people are getting their heads around. People are just seduced by the novelty. You know, how good is it in the longer term? Mm. Okay, that leads me to, I think, I think the final question I'm gonna ask you today, although I'm, I'm loath to let you go, is, if you were leading a school at the moment, what are the questions you'd be asking yourself or what is the advice you wish you would hear? Let's start with Aaron. I think I would be uh, starting from a position of uh, humility. Like, so we're, 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 it's almost like we're in this fog. We're at the very beginning of this. We don't know where it's going. We have to take uh, gentle steps. Uh, I would say that I would, uh, I'd be encouraging, if I was a school leader, I'd be encouraging staff to understand how this technology works and to experiment with it so that they understand the benefits and limitations. Depending on the uh, the policy regulations within my system, uh, I might be encouraging students to use it, but in, but in a guardrail manner so that they understand the nature of uh, you know, plagiarism versus study buddy versus critiquer versus uh, fact checker and using it more for those latter purposes rather than those uh, those earlier purposes. I would also though, I would be guarded about going out, going and getting my credit card out as a, a, as a school or system leader to buy anything that's very expensive right now. So I would be using the free or the low cost versions of things. Uh, and the reason why is that we're sort of in this wild west era where, where almost 2000 apps have emerged overnight, okay? And, and we have no certainty how many of those will still be here in six months or a year's time. Uh, and, and so you might be in a position if you invest a lot in uh, certain technology and you actually invest in training your own local uh, uh, versions of an AI, where you're left with orphanware, and then you have to go back to the drawing board again. So experiment, be wise, and, and recognize that uh, we're, we're at that early stage. Love it. Dylan or John, anything has popped to mind for you? If I was a head teacher right now, I would be doing everything I could think of, including working through our, our implementation book, cheap plug there, <laughs> to give teachers time. I think teachers are going to need a lot of time to think through the implications of this for their practice. And just 
So it's giving teachers time to try these ideas out, you know, just explore getting the AI model to generate lesson plans, just to see what you can do. And I just, I just think more than at any time in the last 40 years, I think teachers need time to think. And that, that would be my number one priority, just finding any way of giving them more time that they don't have to be thinking about the next class and just trying to think about how they might use this technology in the longer term. So take things off the plate where you can. Yeah, and not put anything back. <laughs> yeah. And I want to use that as the leverage, is that uh, right at the moment where we burden schools with every new task and we add and add and add, part of what we need to start to say here is, if we're going down this line, what are we going to take off? And I think there's a lot we can take off. Um, and as we notice in our Room for Impact book, a lot of what schools put on the table is what they put on themselves. So there's an opportunity here to take off. But I want to have a three-pronged attack here. I think there's a, there's a policy imperative which we raise in the paper. We need to move and have the discussion now. We may not solve it immediately, but we need to have a discussion now about what those guardrails are. This moral purpose thing is going to hit us in the face. We saw it with Facebook. And we had the luxury of some time to work through that. And in the early days, there was some major potential for damage. And we saw it all. We know the effects of Facebook on bullying. Um, and I remember a principal telling me not so long ago that the biggest change for him is 20 years ago, he said, I used to have fights down the end of the playground. I used to have the police come. I had broken noses. He said, I don't have that anymore. I said, isn't that a good thing? He said, no. He said, the damage is done through Facebook long before I see it. It happens and there's no boundaries anymore. He said, I could deal with police. I could deal with a broken face, a broken nose, but the bullying, the damage is done. So let's be clear what we have here. We, we have an issue that we needed some policy statements. And I'm not trying to be negative, Nelly. I'm trying to be positive that what are those guardrails? So the, there are some major policy issues about how we use it. Secondly is, is the teachers. Like I was talking with a teacher yesterday who's dead keen in his subject in high school to get into this thing and understand it. And he said, I don't understand it now, but I want to get in. And I think that in the next couple of years, even shorter than that, next year, there's going to be a lot of communities amongst teachers to explore. And I think it's a very healthy thing. Uh, I think the strength of a high school is the degree to which teachers are talking to each other about their passion, their subjects. But the third is, if we don't get going, the students will get going. And we will once again be behind. And I just think that we have an opportunity here to work with our students to explore those boundaries, to explore the options. So I think if you wanted to get into something right now, take a group of students and say, how are we going to play with this? How are we going to do it? And we're going to have a lot of aha moments where we say, hmm, maybe that's not the right way to go. Maybe this is plagiarism. Have those discussions with them. Like my argument always is we do not create the future for our students. They do. So why aren't we involving them in this right now to have the very things that we're scared of, those hard questions about boundaries? They'll need help to do it. That's why they have us as teachers. Let's not hide behind it. Let's confront it. Yes. I think a message that has shown through here is just stay curious. Be curious as a leader. Be curious as a teacher. And try not to cast judgment. We're all learners. So embrace that, which is so cool. Any other points that you guys want to make before we kind of wrap for the time? This is the start of a long discussion, Cindy. So that's a good time to leave it and say it'd be interesting to hear what your viewers think, your listeners think about this, about the very questions we're trying to raise. And I hope in the, the, um, the work that we've produced is that we're, we don't see it as a scary thing. We see it as a set of excitingly scary questions. And I'm fairly confident that I will have changed my mind on at least half a dozen of these issues in six months' time. Well, let's just plan a talk again then, guys. I jokingly have been calling you guys the disciples of AI. I'm like, Dan, I get to, my husband's Dan, I get to talk to the disciples today. And you really did not disappoint. I, I've come away with even more questions and so many ahas. So I'm just so appreciative of your time and the work and the questions you're asking. So thank you guys so, so much for being on today. Thank you. You're welcome.